with that, I'm going to open a public hearing on House Bill 4122. Go ahead and give us a summary. Ian, Kevin Holby, do you want to go? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. House Bill 4122 allows local government to inhibit or prevent production or use of seed or seed products for purpose of protecting seed or seed products that are not genetically engineered from adverse impacts of genetically engineered seed or products. We have the dash three amendments posted on OLIS that replace the measure with labeling requirements for genetically engineered fish destined for human consumption and direct the State Department of Agriculture to adopt rules and establish effective dates. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. For the record, uh, State Representative Paul Holby, uh, House District 8. Uh, I am the sponsor of this legislation, and I uh, bring it forward to the committee for consideration. Uh, this comes about uh, after conversations with many in, in my community uh, who buy organic crop, uh, food, and they also have a lot of farming that uh, is organic as well. And there is also a lot of seed farmers uh, that, uh, both conventional and organic, who are concerned about uh, contamination from genetically engineered crops in neighboring fields. Uh, as you may recall, in the special session, uh, there was a, in 2013, there was a Senate Bill 863, which took away local government's ability to put in place some restrictions on those types of crops and having that local control. Uh, since that time, uh, many uh, farmers and many uh, consumers have all uh, contacted me about this and w didn't feel like uh, this issue has been adequately addressed by the Department of Agriculture since the passage of that bill or that there is a process in place that will protect them from uh, potential contamination which could destroy their their uh, crops. There will be many other people who can elaborate on, on that much more better than I can and answer all the questions. There are, uh, I, I think there's other amendments on OLIS that uh, do have a separate amendment uh, that talks about genetically engineered fish and the re requiring labeling of those genetically engineered fish. Uh, I think it's uh, incumbent upon the, the state to act on this. As it, you know, uh, EPA has approved, uh, uh, which is in the process still, but they have approved a genetically engineered salmon, which uh, causes concern of many people, and they've approved it for food, though I think that has been suspended for the time being. Uh, but I think it's incumbent upon us to join the state of Alaska and a few other states in requiring label of genetically engineered fish just to make sure consumers have, you know, confidence in the fish that they buy. And I, I think that uh, uh, not being able to understand those differences could uh, undermine their confidence. And, and certainly I think the fishing industry uh, as well uh, also is concerned about confusion in this space whether it's between farm regular farm fish or wild fish uh, it's still uh, important for the consumer to know uh, so that uh, is the sort of the substance of that fish there are some exemptions in the bill that uh, could come out later it doesn't apply to shellfish or triploids or uh, medicines and it does not uh, apply to restaurants it's only at the wholesale and consumer our retail spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. So I'm going to call up our first panel, and then I'm going to give a quick explanation of how we're going to do this. We have 26 people who want to testify, so we're going to need to all work together to try and make sure everybody's heard. So first, the people that came from over 100 miles, so Brett Diamond, Chris Hardy, and Kent Nock. And colleagues, uh, just like the other ones, we're not going to work this bill today. So if we could try and not ask questions from the dais and just make sure that people have an opportunity to be heard. And to the extent that the numbers are there, I'm going to alternate panels of for and against so that uh, there's kind of a balanced conversation going forward. And if I could ask you to try and keep your remarks to two minutes. We don't have any kind of light system up here. I'll have a timer up here, and I'll try to gently interrupt if, if you're going over two minutes. So with that, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed.
Uh, good afternoon, Chair Fagan and members of the committee. My name is Brett Diamond. I'm here today in support of HB 4122 for several important reasons. I'm a beekeeper in Lane County and an anthropologist who works with farmers all over the world. As some of you may know, Glory Bee Honey from Eugene recently acquired organic and non-GMO verified certification for their honey products, the very first company in the world to achieve this milestone. And it was not an easy endeavor. It took them over five years to make it happy, happen. We couldn't be prouder of Glory Bee. They are a wonderful company with an excellent reputation of providing high quality products and giving back to our community. But as happy as we are to hear of their success in becoming non-GMO verified, there is a certain level of sadness that comes with the announcement. The sad truth is not a single drop of their non-GMO verified honey comes from Lane County. Not a single drop of their non-GMO verified honey comes from Oregon or even the Pacific Northwest. Indeed, not a single drop of this non-GMO verified honey even comes from the United States. It is all imported. Why? Because in order to attain non-GMO verified status, the hives must be placed at the center of an eight square mile buffer zone that is documented to be GMO free. Bees routinely travel four to six miles when they forage for pollen and nectar, but some do go even farther. And to ensure non-GMO status, an eight mile fly zone is required. Sadly, there is no non-GMO verified honey currently produced in the US because there simply are no eight square mile bee fly zones within the United states that have sufficient food source for bees but no GMO crops. While Lane County could create these non-GMO bee fly zones, we are currently forbidden from doing so under SB 863. Organic agriculture is growing at a tremendous rate. According to the USDA in 2014, there were over 14,000 organic farms in the U.S. producing $5.5 billion in Oregon products. While Oregon ranked ninth in the number of organic farms, we ranked fourth in sales of organic crops producing $237 million of organic products. Thank, thank you, Brett. That's two minutes, Brett. Sorry. Okay. I just I want to make sure everybody gets heard. But thank you. And you can submit any testimony written if you want to submit your written testimony. So it's it, your full testimony is in the record. Go ahead. Thank you, Representative Figgin. Um, my name is Chris Hardy. I'm a farmer from Southern Oregon, and I'm here because I support HB 4122. I'm also uh, a board member of the Southern Oregon Seed Growers Association, and or SASCA, and will be uh, will offer some, several comments just about the SASCA's position um, and nothing about the legislation or. Uh, we do not oppose genetically engineered crops, for the record. I support HB 4122 because I think local farmers and governments have the right to protect themselves from the raising of genetically engineered crops and protect themselves from contamination. Uh, 4122 allows for local democratic process and has nothing, uh, 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 as it relates to GMOs, nothing more, nothing less. If genetically engineered crops stayed where they are planted, I would not likely be here today, but they don't. If my seed crop is contaminated by pollen from genetically engineered crops, I'm breaking federal patent law, and if I try to sell this or if I try to replant them. Also, I don't, uh, don't know of any, any buyers that would, like, that would prefer to buy tainted crops that would basically uh, 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 ruin my markets and my uh, customers uh, interest to work with me in the future. In 2012 I was growing beet and Swiss chard for a contract and uh, there uh, was a Swiss company who grew genetically engineered sugar beets nearby me and um, that resulted in me having to make the decision whether or not to destroy my crop and I, I, I did not knowing the outcome of many months of work that I would have put into producing that crop uh, not knowing whether it, it would have any market value or not, according to our contract buyer. Um, also, on behalf of Saska, I can say that the organization believes there is no realistic basis for saying that farmer-to-farmer -farmer communication or pinning a voluntary system would adequ adequately protect farmers who grow traditionally crops from genetically engineered crops. The argument, real local laws aren't needed, sounds good, but it isn't true. As a farmer growing traditional crops, I hope you can support uh, 40, 4122 House Bill. Thank you. Perfect. Two minutes exactly. Hello. Uh, my name is Kent Nock, and I'm from Rogue River in Jackson County. And I am here in support of uh, 4122. 
I don't want to uh, present a lot of points. I have only one point, and that is if uh, it is possible to ban bands on a statewide uh, basis, and we have people that want to grow non-contaminated crops, who really benefits? There are, there are many players in this game. There are large corporations. There are the public that wants to eat good food. And there are even people far outside of Oregon that depend on Oregon to produce good non-GE seed. So who really benefits if it's possible to prevent local uh, localities from just uh, producing this in-demand non-GE seed? Who benefits? Thank you very much. Thank you. So next, from those who've identified an opposition to the bill, we're going to start with Dan Chen, because he's traveled more than 100 miles, and then Craig Loberg and Scott Dahlman. And please try and keep it to two minutes as well. Thank you. Are you you're Hello. Dan Chen. Okay. So Greg and Scott, are they not out there? Okay, go ahead. I'm not from more than 100 miles. No, that's okay. So oh, there's only one person. I'm trying to bring up panels of three to avoid transition time. So, okay, go ahead. Uh, hello, Madam Chair and, and committee members. I'm a uh, grower from Klamath Falls, Oregon. Uh, third generation uh, potato farmer from Klamath Falls, Oregon. Um, we grow we grow uh, potatoes, grain, wheat. Uh, we grow 75 percent of our potatoes are organic production, uh, and uh, uh, oh, about 50% of our wheat is organic production. Uh, we, we believe in GE as part of the program to help the world, help us supply the world with food. We will, we will, we will not be able to have enough food for the world by not having GMO food. My thought is, uh, uh, if you look at really the science of G food, uh, no one's got sick over it. There, there isn't any any major problems with uh, G, GMO seed, GMO food. Uh, but there is a big hype about it, and uh, I, I believe too that, uh, and, and this is from experience in, in growing crops. It's it's tough to grow organic production. I, I can tell you it's challenging. It's uh, uh, as far as uh, yields and all that, it's it's challenging to, to get the yields in that. And um, so, but but I do it because I like to do the, I like the ground. I like to do it the natural way. Um, but I believe there is a, there is a spot for, for that food. So uh, thank you. Chair Fagan and committee members, thanks for having me here today. Greg Loberg, I'm the manager of West Coast Beet Seed Company here in Salem, Oregon. I'm, a, I'm the president of the Oregon Seed Association, and I'm the public relations chair of the Willamette Valley Specialty Seed Association. I'm here to oppose House Bill 4122. I look at this as uh, detrimental to Oregon. Uh, it's not about coexistence, it is about exclusion, and I think it hurts the state. The Senate Bill 863 was mentioned already. We have placed properly regulatory of crops at a state level and have preempted local governments from creating restrictions that would defeat quality coexistence. We have pesticide preemption that's over 20 years old and has been similarly successful. I was part of the governor's task force that looked at this issue for a year in 2014. No recommendations were made. We simply reestablished that we have ideological differences around farming systems and crop types. I was part of a work group last year in 2015 in regular session in which we again worked on legislative possibilities around this issue. Out of that came a mediation bill, House Bill 2509, and recently, the Oregon Department of Ag has asked many stakeholders, including me, 
to attend a rulemaking session next week to flesh out the way that 2509 should be implemented. So I, I look at the support for 4122 as providing preferential treatment and exclusivity. We have at least two growers that produce for us who produce organic production, conventional, and biotech crops. We are used to working with coexistence, in coexistence with many seed companies on a daily basis. So again, on behalf of the Oregon Seed Association, the Willamette Valley Specialty Seed Association, I oppose adding any restrictions such as those found in House Bill 4122. Thank you. Chair Fagan, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Scott Dahlman. I'm the Policy Director for Oregonians for Food and Shelter. I'm not in front of this committee much, so as a reminder, Oregonians for Food and Shelter represents farmers, foresters, and other technology users across Oregon on issues involving pesticides, fertilizer, and biotechnology. Um, we are here to oppose House Bill 4122 because it divides Oregon agriculture instead of promoting the coexistence that we should be. We believe that Oregon's agricultural diversity is what makes it special in Oregon. We've got over 200 types of crops here, and that's amazing, and we're lucky to have that. And that's what makes it special. They all use different methods, conventional, organic, biotech, but there's room for all of it in Oregon. Because of this diversity, though, coexistence is key, and that's whether you're growing GE crops or not coexistence issues do arise and Oregon farmers have worked together to manage those issues for generations and should continue to be able to do so. So we support anything that encourages coexistence. There are different seed associations um, where pinning is done, those types of methods. Um, we also support uh, the bill that was passed just eight months ago, which sets up a program through the Department of Agriculture for farmers who have concerns about coexistence to be able to go with a mediator and work their issues out. There's lots of ways uh, that cross-pollination could be avoided with pollination timing, physical barriers, different distances. But farmers need to work out that between themselves, not have voters work it out at the ballot box deciding what a farmer can or cannot grow on their own property. Um, this has a built-in supposition that GE crops are somehow more dangerous than other crops, but they are evaluated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and before they are released, the USDA says they are no more dangerous to any neighboring crops than non-GE crops. I see I'm running out of time here. Um, happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, with that, we're going to have Era Atkins, Don Tipping, and Mary Middleton. state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Fagan and representatives. I apologize for that earlier. That was my, my fault. Um, my name is Era Atkins and I'm here um, in support of House Bill 4122. I'm an organic farmer and I'm also a here to represent the Rockford Grange. We're the largest growing grange in Oregon and our members are composed of both conventional and organic growers and we unanimously are in support of this bill. Um, we want to protect, uh, we want the freedom to protect our traditional crops and heirloom varieties from cross-pollination and contamination by GE crops. These traditional and heirloom varieties have stood the test of time. And I, I just want to acknowledge that you know the GMO issue is very contentious and divisive, and um, but the fact stands that we do not have long-term evidence. I mean, they haven't been around long enough for us to know for sure the, about their safety. And uh, we are asking for the ability to protect these pockets of um, genetic diversity, um, uh, biodiversity, uh, these varieties that have stood the test of time for many generations. I mean, I grow a, a, a pole bean that's called Old Mother Stallard, and it came over to the country sewn into the hem of a lady's skirt. 
This was in the 1800s. This variety went through the summer heat and less, less than the ideal amount of water and was prolific and reliable. And I don't want to see these, these old heirlooms threatened because our survival of us as a species may depend on them. Thank you. Well, good day, Madam Fagan, Chair, and all assembled here. My name is Don Tipping, and I'm an organic seed grower and seed company owner in Southern Oregon in Josephine County. I've been earning a living as a farmer for the past 20 years as a certified organic grower. Um, we contract with growers in both Jackson County and Josephine County and beyond to produce organic seed for us, all certified organic through the Oregon Department of Agriculture Certified Organic Program. <laughs> So uh, we're required through our organic certification to be producing a non-GMO seed. So I have a, you know, best, a vested interest in this economically and represent the vested economic interest of about 15 other organic farmers. We lose value when we have a GMO contamination event, of which I've had happen twice through uh, contamination through pollen and planting stock seed, where we lost money directly, and as have our other growers. Oregon's a world-class seed growing region, and it's also organic as the fastest growing sector of agriculture here in Oregon with an increase in 93% uh, of value in between 2008 and 2014, as somebody stated earlier, to almost $240 million in organic produce last year. GMO testing places the burden upon small family farmers, in particular organic growers, where we have to test our seed plots to ensure their purity in order to comply with the organic regulations as per the USDA National Organic Program. <laughs> Senate Bill 863 is inconsistent with other phytosanitary agricultural regulations nationwide and does not encourage agriculture to thrive amidst the diversity of regionally unique agriculture. Um, we've tried to assemble a pinning uh, system down in Southern Oregon and Syngenta, uh, we were invited to them to participate. They're the primary people behind getting GMO sugar beets grown and um, they would not uh, cooperate with us. So, Thanks. Hi, my name is Mary Middleton and I'm the director of Oregonians for Safe Farms and Families. That's based in Josephine County. Um, in Josephine County, we believe that the SB 863 Oregon Seed Bill is unconstitutional. Josephine County is currently in the midst of a lawsuit uh, brought by a biotech funded effort to overturn our GE crop ban. OSFF is an intervener in the case and we are standing to defend the will of the people and protect the small family farmers and our premier seed growing region in the Rogue Valley. Um, we welcome HB 4122 because we believe it will right the wrong that SB 863 created and that is simply what it will do. Unlike a court order, this legislative action sends a strong message to the out-of-state corporate interests that champion the seed preemption bill. The message is that our Oregon's premier seed growing regions and the integrity of our heritage seeds are not for sale. The passage of HB 4122 will show Southern Oregon seed citizens that the legislature is listening to the will of the people. After all, in May of 2014, the majority of both Josephine and Jackson County citizens overwhelmingly voted to protect family farmers and ban GE crops in both counties. Together, this created the largest GE-free zone in the Pacific Northwest. The passage of this bill will embrace the GE-free zone and protect the farms, the farmers, our heritage seeds in the Rogue Valley, southwestern Oregon, and throughout the state. It will also return agricultural decisions to local government. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to have Jerome Rosa, Anna Scharf, and Angie Blacker. And while they're coming up on deck, we have Ray Seidler, Jared Waters, and Ann Barblinger. So you'll be up next. Please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead. Oh, you got me start? Sorry. I thought you were going orders as you called it. So. Uh, 
Chair Fagan and members of the committee, for the record, my name is Angie Blacker and I am the Executive Director of the Oregon Seed Association and the Willamette Valley Specialty Seed Association, um, all companies based right here in Oregon. Um, in 2013, the Oregon Legislature passed Senate Bill 863, preempting local governments from in imposing restrictions on crops, especially those that are genetically modified or engineered. Subsequently, the governor formed a diverse statewide task force that met many times through 2014. Uh, the purpose of this task force was to reduce conflicts between biotech and conventional crops. House Bill 2509 was passed last session with the goal of strengthening coexistence among farmers in Oregon, uh, but now less than a year after passage of House Bill 2509, which has not yet been fully implemented. House Bill 4122 proposes an abrupt shift in course for Oregon's ag industry. Local governments do not have the expertise or resources to properly regulate the agricultural, agriculture industry. The Associated Oregon Counties supported Senate Bill 863 in 2013 because they recognized the complexity and difficulty in regulating the seed industry. Potential local reinstruction restrictions impair the seed industry by making future seed production opportunities subject to limitations and bans. Predictability of quality seed production is paramount to the terrific international reputation that the Oregon seed industry prospers from. Senate Bill 863 ensured that the industry would be operating on a level playing field throughout the state, and attempts to restrict coexistence rather than support it are counterintuitive to all of the work that has been put forth so far today. Uh, this industry needs to be regulated at the state level. For that reason, on behalf of OSA and WVSSA, I do ask that you consider the devastating effects that House Bill 4122 would have on Oregon's second largest industry. Thank you. Chair Fagan and members of the committee, my name is Anna Scharf, and I'm here today on behalf of Scharf Farms, a family-owned and operated farm in Polk County for over 100 years. Last year, our farm grew 10 different varieties of grass seed, four different varieties of wheat, two different varieties of clover, two different brassica crops, wine grapes, hazelnut, and silage corn. No partridge in a pear tree. Those are best left in the Hood River Valley. <laughs> the only GE crop we had was silage corn grown for a local dairy. The ground where the corn was grown is ground that has proven that it can't grow much of anything without costly uh, additives of chemicals and fertilizers. It also has no water and sits on a hill that is prone to erosion. Frankly, I wish we could quit farming this hill, but we rent the ground from an elderly gentleman who relies on it to supplement his retirement income. He's grateful for, grateful for that additional income and thankful that we found a crop that finally works on his land. We as farmers rely on Oregon State University and their ongoing expert research to continually determine the appropriate isolation distances for growing the wide variety of crops that we have. We rely on the Oregon Department of Agriculture to oversee all of Oregon agriculture evenly and equitably and find ways to bring new crops and existing crops together fairly and safely. And some farmers with specialty seed crops use private pinning systems through the Willamette Valley Specialty Seed Association to manage crop isolation and rotation. Bottom line is, successful ag management tools are already in place. Farmers are using them and have for hundreds of years. And cities and counties are not equipped to micromanage which crops should and should not be grown in the state of Oregon. I urge you to take a no vote on House Bill 4122. Thank you. Chair Fager, members of the committee, my name is Jerome Rose, and I'm the executive director of the Oregon Cattlemen's Association, Oregon's largest agricultural industry. OCA is the voice of the cattle industry in Oregon. Our most pressing concern for OCA is house, in House Bill 4122 contains an emergency clause, potentially allowing counties to take immediate action in regulating crops and thereby ranchers, fields, and pastures. Ranchers often graze cattle in pastures containing perennial crops like alfalfa, ryegrass, or clover. If 4122 is passed, it could force many producers to tear up their crops they are already planted, resulting in a total loss for them with no compensation. GE seed is often a large upfront investment that farmers recoup by the lower input costs over the life of the crop. If a farmer is forced to remove that crop, as many local measures have proposed, it could result in significant losses for those growers. 
Further, it would require producers to scramble to find adequate alternatives for feeding animals that don't require overgrazing and meet nutritional needs of their animals. For some feed crops, over 90% of the available seeds are to eat, leaving few alternatives if these crops aren't available. If House Bill 4122 creates a range of risks and potential expenses, not just for primary growers, but for the livestock producers dependent on such crops. OCA is also concerned with allowing each local entity to enact seed regulations, creating a paperwork of regulations across the state. To the budgetary constraints on our local government, we are concerned that the level of analysis and scientific scrutiny such regulations have before enactment. The seed and other products we use to feed cattle as well as the beef we produce are currently regulated by the United States Department of Ag, FDA, and EPA, all of which have the needed expertise and scientific data to make informed decisions on safety. Finally, this patchwork of regulations will unduly burden producers on an individual level. Livestock and dairy producers determine which crops to plant based on what they need to feed their herds a nutritious, balanced diet. It's not uncommon for grazed land and pastures to spin across multiple county and city jurisdictions. Under this patchwork of local, local regulations, individual producers would be forced to contend with multiple regulations across their properties or purchase more expensive alternative forages for an entire operation just to comply with one jurisdiction's ordinance or code. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next up, we're going to have Ray Seidler, Jared Waters, and Ann Barblinger. And on deck is Julie Fergula and Helen Rudenkla. Rudin Dr. Ray Seidler and I live in Ashland. Um, I have a PhD in microbiology and that experience uh, will be reflected today. I went to work for the US EPA, United States Environmental Protection Agency, and there I was a chief scientist in charge of the biosafety program for evaluating genetically engineered crops. So I have about uh, 30 years experience on this topic. In 1994 I helped put together an international meeting, a symposium involving about 50, 60 scientists from around the world, and almost everyone expressed in that symposium symposium a concern in the future about cross-pollination between genetically engineered crops and natural or conventional or organically grown crops. And I thought, since I haven't heard this, and I was also used to be a teacher, I want to know that GMO, GE, genetically engineered, genetically modified, all mean the same thing. What the heck is a genetically engineered crop and how does it differ from conventional crossbreeding? Uh, well, let me say that natural cross-pollination involves transfers of thousands of genes on about 20 chromosomes, typically, in higher plants. And that cross-pollination happens between the same species or very closely related species. The sexual reproduction has evolved over the millennia and involves special differentiated tissues and cells. On the other hand, GE or genetically engineered crops are made by humans in a laboratory, not natural, and it's really an asexual reproduction process. Thank you very much. The genes. Thank you. That's two okay. minutes. Thank you. Sorry. You can, but you, if you could submit the rest as written testimony, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank everybody for listening to me today, a seventh generation Oregonian farmer. My family has been farming in Oregon since Oregon was just a territory. I'm a Republican, non-organic farmer. Excuse me, sorry, can you state your name for the record? Jared Waters. Um, I'm a Republican, non-organic farmer, and I once thought that GMO crops were the way of the future and touted them as such. Then I grew GMOs for several years and learned more about them. I likely grew one of the largest crops of GMOs in the county I live in. 
I saw other farmers have crops contaminated by their neighbors and lose lots of money having to destroy their hard work. Then when GMO wheat escaped a test plot in part of Oregon, hundreds away, miles away from me, it shut down all exports of Oregon wheat. This had far-reaching effects for the farm I was managing lost over $50,000 when these exports stopped. Pollen can travel long distances, up to five miles, especially in windy areas. GMO pollen can cross property lines and contaminate another crop. I see this as trespass, and there's nothing I can do about it. In an ideal world, farmers can work together, but ultimately, people are stubborn and will do as they please. I should not put risk. I should not put others at risk of losing their crop due to this contamination. No farmer can legally sell a crop that has been contaminated by GMO pollen, as that is a violation of federal patent law. GMO manufacturers may claim they won't sue, but their track record of doing so speaks for itself. The Oregon wheat scare was not alone. Wheat showed up in another place in 2014 where it was not supposed to be. Hay exports have also been affected by this as well. Uh, the last the year before last, the exports of Pacific Northwest alfalfa were stopped when uh, such contamination was found. I believe the only way to protect Oregon farmers growing traditional crops is by having local control. Only the local government knows its agricultural condition and knows what's best in their area. Oregon is a home rule state, and that is part of the way Oregon was founded, and we need to retain that. Local government can adopt uh, and it can adapt to protect its farmers from the dangers GMOs present. Jackson and Josephine counties had this bipartisan support and passage of their measures uh, doing such. I want my son and his children to have the opportunity to grow traditional crops here in Oregon without the risks of contamination. Once we lose our traditional crops, we can't get them back. Please protect Oregon farmers' rights by voting yes on HB 4122. Thank you very much. Madam Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Ann Berblinger. I'm a farmer in Gales Creek in western Washington County. We grow more than 300 varieties of um, <coughs> more than 300 varieties of herbs and vegetables, and I've submitted, I guess for the record, uh, a little set of the six kinds of kale. <laughs> um, the seed for that kale comes from two Oregon companies, um, Wild Garden Seed in Philomath and adaptive seed in um, near Sweet Home, Oregon. Um, those are some of our just beautiful, attractive things, and the, part of our competitive advantage is having that kind of um, variety and diversity in our crops. Um, I've been a farmer for 16 seasons, um, but before my second yeah. career. Um, I quit my day job in 2007, so I overlapped for a little while. But before that, I did economic development. And one thing I learned from economic development um, is that the first principle of economic development is to work with, protect, and enhance the opportunities for su success of your existing local businesses, particularly those that are dynamic and growing and innovative, like our organic farms and, and uh, many of the seed companies that have been represented here today. Um, to put them at risk in order to create an opportunity for a kind of economic activity that happens all over the place is really a stup stupendous blunder. Um, last summer, um, we watched while the farm across the street was um, spraying a pesticide from a helicopter, and we sat there with biting our fingernails. There wasn't a breath stirring. They knew what they were doing. They were following the rules that was safe. We're safe from pesticides and, uh, um, for that reason, and, and if um, we are subject to pesticide drift, we have some recourse. Um, if we lose some of our own, own um, crops that we've developed and the seeds we save from them, um, there's no recourse, and that's a loss that's forever, Thank not you. just for one season. Thank you very much. Next up, we'll have Julie Perlman, Helen Rudenclaw. And on deck is Ivan Maluski, Amy Van Son, and Elise Sleegly. Yeah, I'm just struggling today. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to read printing now. You yeah, don't it's hard so to read. much fun. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Hello, 
my name is Julie Fergala. I'm the pre-commercial manager from Beta Seed Inc. Beta Seed is a leading sugar beet seed producer in North America. We've been producing sugar beets in the Lambent Valley since 1972 and we're committed to Oregon. In 2012 we underwent a four and a half year 41 million dollar investment project to upgrade our seed processing facility in Tangent, Oregon. We employ 70 full-time people and during the busy season can employ up to 150 additional temporary labor. We are accredited through an industry-wide certification called Excellence Through Stewardship. ETS ensures that we have adequate, adequate standard operating procedures in place to maintain the integrity of our product. Our product is 100% GE. We do not have the option to produce conventional because our customers do not demand it. We have there have been no reported financial losses from an organic or other seed producer by a GE crop in the Willamette Valley. We also pit our fields and abide by Willamette Valley Specialty Seed Association bylaws. We've been able to coexist in Willamette Valley for over 40 years. Legislators should not let emotional bills affect what is right for Oregon. If passed, using example set by Jackson Josephine County, we'd be forced to produce seed outside of Oregon. Beta Seed's annual, annual operating income is around $32 million, most of which is kept locally. Beta Seed has built long-term and trusting relationships with growers who would lose uh, their sugar beet crops in their rotation. Beta Seed supports the local community through Salvation Army, holiday donations, raced in poverty Sir Optimus Walk, Albany Big Pickup, uh, keeping Albany streets clean, Hood to Coast, just to name a few. We are the community, we are the names and faces, the mothers and fathers. Overturning a preemption law established in 2013 does not make sense for Oregon. Please support us in voting no on House Bill 4122. Chair Fagan, members of the committee, my name is Hele Rettenclaw, and I'm here today to urge you to vote no on House Bill 4122. My husband and I have a family farm in Yamhill and Cook counties. We raise eight to ten different crops each year, which include both GE and non-GE crops. I have a master's in plant breeding genetics and crop science from OSU, and to me the plant breeding method used to develop a crop is less important than the specific trait that variety contains. For example, we've grown wheat, which carried resistance to a certain herbicide. This trait was developed by treating seeds with a mutagen, but by definition this is not a GE crop. The GE crops we've tried include a small trial of Roundup Brady soybeans, we've grown Roundup Brady field corn, and produced Roundup Brady sugar beet seed. We are seed growers. That is our specialty. We are acutely aware of the requirements for seed purity and how to maintain those standards. For most seed crops, those requirements are laid out in the Certified Seed Handbook with specifications for each type of certified seed produced in Oregon. If your neighbor plants a field of the same type as yours, you may have to leave a buffer strip which cannot be marketed with the rest of the seed to ensure the genetic purity of the main lot. This is an economic disadvantage to us, but something which all certified seed growers deal with, and we're not going to get an argument with our neighbor over it. For other seed crops we grow, the system is a little different. Well before we started farming, the specialty seed growers in the Willamette Valley got together and agreed to a unique system of pinning to ensure genetic purity of their crops. In our case, we grow an open pollinated white sprouting radish for the Japanese market. This must be isolated from other radishes. Now that we've grown white radish in a certain area for a number of years, we essentially have priority or seniority. However, if one year we choose not to grow it, another farmer or company can come in and pin it for their production. This voluntary cooperative system has worked remarkably well for many years. Oregon's currently in the middle of a research program studying the impact of growing canola within the valley. This has been a contentious issue, but it's progressing with the Oregon Department of Ag overseeing the research and the limited seed production happening as a part of it. Thank you very much. Sorry, we've got quite a few people who still want to be here, but you can certainly submit it as written testimony. Thank you very much. All right, with that, we have Ivan Maluski, Amy Van Son, and Elise Sleepley. Oh, there you go, there you go. <laughs> and then on deck is Emily Cooper, Joe <clears throat> Rodler, and Jim Myron. Go ahead, thank you. All right, uh, Chair Fagan, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Ivan Maluski. I'm the policy director with Friends and Family Farmers. We are a statewide organization with 5, 000, more than 5,000 members and supporters statewide. We work with small to mid-sized farmers, both organic and conventional around the state. 
Uh, we are in support of House Bill 4122, and we appreciate that you're taking the time to hear it. I wanted to uh, alert you to a couple pieces of material we passed up today. Um, we've sent you up a sign-on letter uh, supporting uh, House Bill 4122 that is signed by a number of family farm, organic industry, and environmental organizations. And I've also passed up a letter from the Provender Alliance, which is a, a membership organization based in Lyons, Oregon, which consists of retailers, manufacturers, brokers, and distributors in the food industry serving tens of thousands of Oregonians, all in support of House Bill 4122. Just to clarify a couple of points, um, I've submitted a written testimony, I won't read it, uh, and, and we've included some, some background, which I think you'll find useful there. Um, to, to, com to address a couple of comments I heard, uh, First of all, the bill does not have an emergency clause, as one previous panelist said. So there is, a, we, we've, unlike, I believe, the original 863, which did have an emergency clause, we do not have an emergency clause on this bill because we think that it's important to have to, for local communities to have these discussions um, in, a, in a thoughtful way. Uh, number two, House Bill 2509, which was mentioned earlier, which was passed two years ago. We were surprised to learn that the ODA, just before the session, was now con convening some rules. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to make their rules advisory committee as it's happening smack dab in the middle of the legislative session. But to be clear, though we support the concept of mediation as an alternative to litigation, that bill did not solve the problem that those of us, including myself, who were on the governor's task force on, on genetic engineering, which the state authorized $100,000 uh, for back in 2014, it, that 2509 does not address the concerns and the, and the, the desired need by many farmers, and you've heard some from, t from some today, for concrete on-the-ground protections. All this bill does today is allow local communities to establish those concrete on-the-ground protections based on local conditions. And if a county doesn't want to do it, they don't have to. So that's that's kind of, I think, an important point. Thank you. I gather that I'm at my, end, my okay. two minutes, so Thank hopefully you. you read the testimony, and thanks for your op the opportunity to testify. Go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Amy Van Son, and I'm with the Center for Food Safety. I'm an attorney with them. Uh, Center for Food Safety is a nation nationwide nonprofit public interest in organization. We have over 750,000 members that are consumers and farmers, including uh, tens of thousands here in Oregon. Uh, we bring a long history of uh, working on the issue of genetic uh, engineering uh, on all levels of government. Uh, including working with dozens of states and counties to craft bills regulating GE crops. Uh, one of our, so we've supported Jackson County in their successful ordinance and we helped defend Jackson County when they were sued to overturn that ordinance. Uh, that case has now settled, but uh, an important point to take away from that case is that uh, Oregon, when Oregon counties regulate genetically engineered crops, they are not prohibited from doing so under existing Oregon law, including Right to Farm Act. Um, and the only thing that blocks the other Oregon counties from having similar rights to Jackson is SB 863. Uh, this is why, of course, we support um, HB 4122. Um, all the farmers that are here have told you and will tell you, give you more stories about the harms from GE crops, including transgenic contamination, as sort of the number one, one to highlight today. Uh, farmers have literally lost billions of dollars in this country from transgenic contamination. It's a recognized harm by both the USDA and numerous courts. So from a legal perspective, I want to highlight that this is a legally cognizable harm when you are suffering from transgenic contamination of your crops, and the, even the Supreme Court has agreed with that. Uh, that means that farmers have a right to go to court, seek redress, seek damages. Um, that is why it's so important for government to step in. We've had a failure at the federal level for these protections, and the state of Oregon has also not enacted the protections that are necessary to prevent contamination before it happens. Um, HB 2509, the mediation program, again, as Ivan said, is not uh, enough of a protection to prevent before contamination happens. Mediation is great, and that program could continue and should continue under uh, HB 4122. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Nice okay. Thank you. Go ahead. So I'll try and be as quick as possible. My name is Elise Higley. I'm a farmer in Oregon, and um, I'm not a politician. And as you can see, seeds and their, our seed supply and food supply is very political. It's amazing how much um, power is sitting in this room here. So I became involved because I heard about what happened with 863 and the grand bargain. And I honestly was just so astounded that I thought, I have to get out of my field, and I have to take action, and I have to let the community know that as farmers, we really rely on seeds. And this is where it comes, a lot of people aren't connected to that. Our seed supply is the future of our food. And we have to look at the idea that 95% of the seed in the world is owned by the five largest chemical companies. So we're here, we formed our Family Farms Coalition. Um, 
um, hundreds of farmers came together and we said this is a really important battle to fight in Jackson County. We set federal precedent and my um, mission and promise to myself was if we could beat that a million dollars that they tried, the chemical companies tried to fight our measure with in Jackson County, I uh, would come here to the Capitol and make right 863. And so that's what I'm here doing today. Um, I want to just explain that this measure like you talked about that is supposed to be with mediation, um, I think that's all great and well, but the reality is, is we're also business people and we employ lots of employees and to wait for a couple of years and then to get our seed tested and then to find out we're contaminated and then to deal with uh, mediators, lawyers, no offense, um, you know, it's not something we really want to do. We're just trying to farm and grow food. So, um, no offense, uh, Representative Rayfield, because I think you're a lawyer. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, I just want to say that, you know, we're looking at um, local government. We saw that it works at a local level in Jackson and Josephine County. But the good thing is, you don't have to take a stance on whether you think GE is the future of the world or you think traditional crops are the way to go. You don't have to deal with any of that because that's not what this bill does. This bill puts the decision making back to the local government. And that's where it's been for 150 years and that's where it should be. It's where people can't get bought out at a local level. We saw it happen in Jackson County and we believe that, that justice and protecting seed is the way to go at a local level. So thank you for your time. Thank you all very much. Thank you. All right. Emily, Joe, and Jim. And then on deck, we're getting very close colleagues. Thank you for, uh, and thank you to everybody. Your testimony has been very succinct. I appreciate that. Uh, on deck is Nitsa, Bernard, and Natalie White. Go ahead, Emily, start. Thank you, Chair Fagan, members of the committee. My name is Emily Cooper. I own Full Cellar Farm, a mixed vegetable farm outside of Gresham, east of Portland. I support House Bill 4122 because I believe that local governments are well suited to make decisions that protect agriculture in their area. Agriculture is by nature a local business. We operate according to the local laws of soil type, weather patterns, and topography. What makes sense for one part of the state with regard to farming may not make sense for another. Windy areas, wide flat expanses, or places with many small farms clustered together tend not to have the natural protections against pollen drift that other areas might enjoy. Because I grow my crops without the use of chemical fertilizers or pesticides, I especially rely on regional seed growers to produce vegetable varieties that are adapted to our location and climate. Areas of the state that have a lot of traditional seed growers or traditional farms accustomed to saving their own seed need rules in place that would protect them from GE crops that could contaminate the seed supply. Once a seed crop is contaminated by GE pollen, those seeds can no longer be sold or used. Agriculture is a low margin business and this kind of disaster could ruin a farmer. At the very least, it creates a risky environment in which no good business person would want to grow certain crops. Farmers like me, who don't grow our own seed but rely on regional seed companies for robust, locally adapted varieties, would also be negatively impacted. As more genetically engineered crops become approved for use, more conflicts will undoubtedly arise. Local governments need the tools to be able to respond appropriately to these conflicts. Please support House Bill 4122 and restore local power over local agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jim Meyer, and I'm here representing the Native Fish Society. Uh, we did not take a position on the original bill, but when we became aware of the Dash 3 amendments, we took a look at them and thought that they were a very good idea. So I'm here today to support the Dash 3 amendments, providing the opportunity for, for consumers to know when they are purchasing a GMO fish is very, very important, and uh, I think it's something that Oregon should do. Thank you. Chair Pagan, members of the committee, my name is Joe Rolator. I'm here today representing Desert Springs Trout Farm. I'm here to testify in favor of House Bill 4122 with the Dash 3 Amendment. Um, Desert Springs Trout Farm is a private trout hatchery in eastern Oregon. We grow about 400,000 pounds of trout a year. Uh, most of the trout are delivered live for restocking in lakes and ponds. Um, our customers are Cal Gaines, Mono County, uh, ODFW, and uh, Fishing in the City in San Francisco. Um, our water is an artesian source that comes out of the ground at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Uh, we use no chemicals. We use no uh, shore power, except we have two 60-watt light bulbs in our hatch house. Other than that, we use no other power. Um, all of our trout are triploids. Uh, triploids, first of all, I want to make sure triploids are not genetically modified crops. And the handouts that um, I've given you will, will point that out. Um, triploids are made several different ways, but they have um, three chromosomes instead of two, like a regular trout, and they're sterile. Um, they do not reproduce. They grow very fast because they do not reproduce. And um, we, we think they're a superior uh, product. We are currently developing, as I said, all our fish are stocked now, but we're developing a food fish, mar a food market, and we've developed a fish that will grow on a vegetable diet. Um, so we think it's very important that um, House Bill 4122 pass um, with the Dash 3 amendments so that um, fish are labeled, genetically modified fish are labeled properly. All thank right. you. Thank you all very much. Okay, we're winding down. We have five people left signed up. So uh, Nitza, Bernard, Natalie White, and Scott Suzadale. Suzadale? Uh, hello, my name is Natalie Reitman White. I'm from Eugene, Oregon. I'm here representing Organically Grown Company. We're the North, Northwest's largest distributor of organic fruits and vegetables, been around for 30 years, owned by farmers and close to 300 employees. Uh, we distribute over 100 million pounds of organic fruits and vegetables annually throughout the Northwest. I'm also here representing the Oregon Organic Coalition, which uh, represents hundreds uh, of scientists, consumer, producer, retailer uh, groups across the state. And uh, we are in support of House Bill 4122. Um, the fact of the matter is the state of Oregon has failed to protect farmers from unwanted contamination from genetically engineered crops, which leaves farmers vulnerable to economic damages and infringes on their rights to farm with traditional seeds. Uh, Senate Bill uh, 863 stripped communities of these rights, and in the last two years, um, the state has failed to make um, the substantive progress on GMO issues and contamination issues at the state level um, through the GMO Task Force and the Department of Agriculture. And unwanted uh, transgenic contamination is a very real issue <coughs> for farmers in Oregon, particularly those who use, utilize organic practices, which the USDA National Organic program prohibits the use of GMOs, um, and for those who have a vested interest in exports, um, as many nations in the world have banned the sales of genetically engineered crops. Oregon is unique in that we are one of the foremost regions in the world for growing vegetable seed, and we are a strong exporter of agricultural products such as wheat and alfalfa. And as others have mentioned, Oregon is fifth in the nation for total organic acreage, which has seen a 93% increase in the last seven years. I'll say for our own business, We've experienced double-digit growth uh, every year since I've been there for the last decade. So there's strong consumer support and a growing organic market. Um, uh, Thank consumers. you. That's actually that's right at two minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. And then final panel, Bob Olson and Tom Wolf. Fagan committee members, uh, Bob Olson with Association of Northwest Steelheaders. Uh, I am also here on behalf of the Dash 3 amendments to this uh, consumer friendly amendment as a, as a friendly amendment to this bill. And uh, this bill does address an important area of evolving science. It's a valuable way to keep the public uh, more fully informed. Thank you. Chair Fagan, committee members, for the record, my name is Tom Wolf, the executive director of the Oregon Council of Trout Unlimited. I also am here to support. Uh, the Dash 3 amendments, which deals with uh, uh, genetically modified fish. Recently, in fact, last August, the uh, American Fishery Society had their national annual meeting here in Oregon where 4,000 fishery biologists were gathered from all over the world to talk about different seminars. One of the uh, 
big subject was genetically modified fish, GMOs, and, it's, and the nickname we have for those are Frankenfish, and uh, there's a great amount of concern about it. What, uh, what I like about this bill is it allows the labeling so people are, can be aware of GMO uh, fish and uh, can make their uh, informed decision, and uh, we, we applaud Representative Holby for what he's trying to do here and support this bill and this amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, and I, I've called everybody who's on. Go ahead. I've called everybody who's on the list. Was there anybody else who traveled here today with an intent to be heard on House Bill 4122? Going once. Okay, with that, I'm going to close the public hearing on House Bill 4122.